unit. Shall I try? Is this important? This doesn't. It was there like that yesterday too. It, if you're going to use this, yes, it will be better. Mm -hmm. Like the the last intervention of yesterday, where the the, the professor was speaking through this, because I can get this sound off. So it will be it will be great if they can use this microphone. Yes, but then if you they use this microphone, that's the microphone with this. That's yeah. working together. Yeah. Okay, but now I need to put it on, and I I hope I hoped that someone of our team was coming to make it, but he is not there. Because it's not. Uh, so is it on. is it connected? No, we have to put it on now. Let's see. Let's go. Uh, uh, no, you need. I think. Um, you need um, power. Power connection. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, of course, that wouldn't work. Sorry for that. No, I think that. Okay. So, shall I open here also? Where is it? Shall I put it on now or at the last time? Sorry, um. I think that that's why. I go. It's a bit far for me to go now, but ah, oh, that, that no, look, it goes far. It goes far. There. You see one place? No, there is no more place. Mais je suis en train d'essayer de mettre ça en marche maintenant, les autres sont pas là. Oui, si vous le micro là-bas, vous avez déjà géré. Ok, et moi c'est ça que je dois faire. Ah, je sais pas très bien comment faire. Je mets tes clés là-dedans, je vais fermer l'ordinateur. Merci, il a la sécurité. Lui doit partir, mais je vous dirai qu'il n'aura pas écrit du tout le... Le truc, pas question de payer sur toute 26 euros pour l'autre. Ah oui, ok, ah oui, c'est moi qui les connecte d'office en fait. Oui, 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 mais on n'a pas utilisé. Ok, ça va. Mais euh, parce que on n'a pas utilisé, la preuve c'est qu'il était sur le bord. Si on l'avait utilisé, on l'avait appris, il a fait une scène. Attends, ici, moi j'ai toujours un peu peur. Donc, euh, on a un technicien quand même. Ah oui, fort. il est là. Ici. Attends, on va bien le garder, on va faire une seconde. Ça c'est un. Then. So, after, after, we will be in Can I just okay. 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 Volume. Oui, oui. Uh, huh? Un moment. Do you see something? Yeah, yeah. I just... Is this important? Is it crazy? 
Ah, voilà, Florian, ouf. Donc ici, merci. Ah, the volume? No, the volume is this one. But uh, we'll leave it like this for the moment. OK. Ça, c'est pas encore allumé. This is not allumé. Thank you. Non, pas, pas encore. Ah non, ah voilà. This is. You need one more. Uh... No, it's fine. Okay, now it's on. I'm just a bit worried about this thing too close to. No, I, I already did it yesterday. Yeah. I mean, I can control okay. the input volume. Okay. One, two, three, one, two, three. Yes. I test. One, two, three. Which good? Ça va? Okay, now the microwaves are tested. Uh, 
I would like to welcome you for this second conference day. Uh, I hope that those who were at the improvisation session have started cooperating uh, even more than they did before. Um, so, I, as some of the thankings to the sponsors that lost yesterday in the, um, in the PhD defense that was happening at the same time as our reception, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank again at least two of our sponsors. Uh, the first one is uh, Biodiversity International. Um, it's an organization that I think most of you might know, but for those who, 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 who do not know the organization, uh, I would invite them just to go to the, um, to the website of Biodiversity, where you will see the major involvement uh, of this organization in uh, support for livelihood um, everywhere in, uh, in the world, and the links are between uh, livelihood improvement and biodiversity protection. Um, for the people working more in the field of the digital commons, uh, it's interesting to know that um, Jokai Benkler in the wealth of networks has clearly cited the system of the CGIR, kind of anal analogous system to the, uh, the open system uh, where uh, a group of people are debugging uh, problems with seeds and trying to improve them for food security in a collaborative worldwide network. And uh, the openness and the collaboration is organized in, uh, in a distributed uh, modular way, which is very similar to open source software. So it's interesting to see that there are some similarities there between the genetic resource commons and the digital commons. So uh, I would like to thank you for making possible sessions on genetic resource commons, uh, thanks to this uh, contribution. Another sponsor is uh, Goog uh, Google. Um, I just mentioned this because uh, thanks to Google we are able to uh, record uh, the keynote sessions and um, to live stream them on the internet so that other Commons uh, scholars can uh, benefit from these presentations as well. Uh, so now I would like to introduce um, this morning session which will be chaired by uh, Charlotte Hess, uh, who many might know. She's a a long-time scholar of the Commons. Uh, she has been collaborating with uh, Lynn Ostrom for over uh, 20 years at least. Uh, she's also the founder of the, the Digital Library of the Commons, uh, which was one of the first uh, initiatives of that kind. Uh, and interestingly, uh, the Digital Library of the Commons did also capacity building in developing countries, uh, providing training to libra librarians so that they could themselves have the capacity to build their own digital libraries. So to have this kind of decentralized commons community spreading around. So Charlotte was the initiator of that. She's working now at uh, Syracuse uh, University and she will be chairing this morning session. So please, Charlotte. Good morning. Yesterday we learned from the speakers, our esteemed colleagues, Paul David and Jerome Reichman, about uh, the enormous complexities of global commons. And um, certainly uh, in the study of the knowledge commons that one of our greatest assignments is to better understand um, the theory and the practice of global commons. It's, some, it's an area that really we know too little about um, for many reasons and the uh, enormous coordination costs, the transaction costs and the, all the obstacles and the ongoing management, monitoring, and uh, maintenance, the long-term sustainability of any type of global commons is um, going to be one of the great challenges. It already is a great challenge, but one going to be one of the major great challenges in the world. So this morning, we are really, really pleased to have two renowned scholars who have made enormous inroads in the practice um, of global commons. So this will be um, just a, a, a real delight for, for us to, to, to learn from, from, from both Samir Bamachari and from Emil, Dr. Emil Frisson. The first speaker we'll have is uh, Dr. Sam uh, uh, Bamachari, who um, has so many distinctions and titles, but let me say that he is the founder director of CSIR, the Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, IGIB, the chief mentor of CSIR and OSDD, which is uh, open source drug discovery. 
He's, and he's the Director General of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research uh, in New Delhi, India. And his talk today will be Open Source Drug Discovery as an Innovative Model for Affordable Health Care for All. So please welcome Dr. Um, Ramit Pari. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, the form for inviting me and all of you to be here in the morning. <coughs> I don't remember when I last attended a meeting in which I did not know a single participant before I arrived in the meeting. <laughs> I can't recall. I was just trying to recall, and I couldn't figure it out. So I have divided my talk first five minutes to give you a background from which I arrived at the comments from the job I do. And then I'll spend a few minutes to say why it is possible to do open source drug discovery and then tell you next 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever I have to say what you have done so far. If I would have, when I gave this title, first time in UK, that, but my title was a question mark, is open source drug discovery a possibility of a solution for affordable healthcare? And I can tell you, I remember, it was resounding no. And people said, you are crazy. It will never happen. Uh, <coughs> I was most happy when the last year, the American Chemical Society had a whole day session in its, interna in its national, you know, in its annual congress, dedicated one day to open source drug discovery, and I was asked to give my plenary talk. So you can see from a complete resounding no, it has moved to possibility, and maybe a reality in the future. I want to show you that uh, India is always believer of open source, whether it is Ayurveda, 4,000 year old of medicine, surgery, or even innovative sex education has been open source. Imagine if it was not. <laughs> I was born in the state, city of Calcutta, where the Tagore, who said, where the mind is free, without fear, and the head is held high, where the knowledge is free. So I just want to establish the philosophy of free and openness and sharing was built in the ethos. Why I said open source will work in India, I don't know about this. Where the mind led forward by their ever-winding thoughts and action, then the clear stream of vision has not broken into dreary deserts of the bad habits, and we make it free. And this is a very great example that the education in 500 years BC was actually very, very open. Whole world's Europe scholars used to come here because everything was shared, of the knowledge from astronomy to everything. The innovation new ecosystem is bridging the gap. And you can see the cell phone usage has enormously gone up, although the cell phone was invented in this part of the world. And Nokia makes more business than India. And nano car is innovation. I'm sure even putting six people on a scooter is also a lot of innovation. The Nesta report, which has come out this year, has looked at Google innovation, the relief industry from the UK, and the efficient drastic. And what is interesting, the nano car has been placed efficient whereas open source drug discovery has been built at one of the most drastic reduction. This is a survey published by Nesta of UK. <coughs> in the post-independent India, CSR is the innovation chain system, major player, and my job is to manage these 37 laboratories, 39 extension centers, and six units. And historically, the Prime Minister of India is the president of CSR society. So that there's one advantage. You have clear political patronage. This is over 4,600 scientists and approximately about a billion dollar of budget. 
Before I talk about open source, I want to show you, you talk open source after having intellectual property. So therefore, as you can see, CNRS India has a reasonable amount of intellectual property compared to CNRS France, Max Planck Germany, State of Australia, China, or France. So therefore, I'm talking from a point of view, after owning intellectual property, why should do things in commons? Not when you are weak, okay? You can talk about proliferation, non-proliferation, after having the bomb, but not having the bomb. So any patent before granting, one has to search, and this is now accessible to all the PTOs of the world, including Japan, Australia, USA, UK, Germany, everybody has signed. And since then, very large number of patent taking on traditional medicine has stopped. So given this scenario, we ask a question, affordable healthcare is open source model for drugs and pharmaceutical. I'm sure if you're an American, you'll think you must be kidding. You are where you are because you first imagined it. And it's interesting that India is the first country where the first president of CSIR, Pandit Nehru, who actually inaugurated a public funded drug research institution in 1958. Mrs. Gandhi said, my idea is better order all the world in which the medical discoveries will be free from patents and there'll be no profiteering from life and death. So this ethos, based on this, policy decisions were taken. And the policy decision in 1911 intellectual property law made India the most expensive drug pharma in 70s. The 70s, the change in process patent, new patent law, allowed process patent against product patent. Today we are actually third in the world and 14th in terms of the value. So we produce world's cheapest medicine and the life expectancy went up from 32 to 64, is now 67, without an economic growth. This is the only country where you have a grow without. The reason is low cost medicine. And three of the CSR laboratories actually contributed. Every drug that you can think you get in now, you know 90% of the generic drugs are processed, were developed in various CSR laboratories and that generated I'll give one example, HIV. Drug was invented in this part of the world, but CIPLA with CSIR came up with a cheaper cost of production, and you can see how the drug price fell from $10,000 shipment to $80 shipment. And this change created affordability. Today, Africa is saved because of this effort. Question we have to ask ourselves, can we let 4,000 people die per day in tuberculosis? Is there a solution? So if you look at accessibility and affordability, this is an index, six top companies of the world in which four are Indian companies, and you can see Teva is the Israeli company which comes in, are the six companies which actually provide you accessibility and affordability. Now you will always say, can you invent? You have done new processes. So therefore I want to show you one example. Then we started with the reverse engineering of a natural streptokinase, gone into recombinant streptokinase, which is then we went to clot specific, which is exactly binds to the clot doesn't. And eventually with the fourth generation, we could not, we are unable to develop ourselves. So we are handed over at a very high royalty. So you can see, it is possible within the a public funded system to reach up to this and the invention is possible. So this gave me confidence and this is one example, less than $5 million we use and develop from Ayurvedic preparation, a peperine, which we just identify and by mixing with rifampicin, we can reduce the rifampicin from 450 milligram to 200 milligram and it's the first time a new tuberculosis drug, which is put 23% cheaper, because CSIR gave away all the royalty in the process 
its price was 23% cheaper than the old drug, which is 50 years old. So what I wanted to show you, it is possible. So we came up with a three-tier intellectual property. What is, we have, we, when the limited people who have it, like a 3D television, if you have technology, or some, how to get wrinkle out of your face, make it as expensive as possible and get economic return as much possible to the organization. When it is required for a large number of people, create non-exclusive licensing. And when you want to create an affordable for all, go it open source. So that's the philosophy with which it has been built. You might have seen the announcement the government of India will spend $5 billion over the next two years to create an only prescription drug that will be allowed will be a generic drug to boast the generic industry. No surprise that the United States today, actually 90% of the substitutions are moving into generic. So therefore, it is nothing very surprising. Because when you can't afford it, what else do you do? So access to affordable healthcare is a right for all on this premise, open source drug discovery initiative of 50. Now this I've two, three slides I borrowed from uh, Munoz, Bernard Munoz slide, to show that the 90% of the prescription is generic. It is falling flat. Nothing much is happening in big pharma. There is no growth at all. The genome sequencing, whereas, you know, I come from the genomic science, genome sequencing, whereas, has dropped from billion dollars to thousand dollars. And being a member of the XPRIZE advisory board, I can tell you the next year, you will all get at less than thousand dollar genome sequencing. So the whole thing is happening. Whereas the drug discovery has gone up. It doesn't make any sense why it is happening. If you break down the cost, you will see the discovery cost is approximately 40 to 50 percent, and 60 percent, about 50 to 60 percent, is the developmental cost. Phase one, phase two, clinical trial. So let's look at the big top farmers. How are they performing? You can see each drug, total R&D expenditure, each drug has gone from $3 million to $11 million, each company is spending, and this is just not sustainable and nothing much is happening in the pipeline. What is worse that you can see 111 phase three trials, what does it mean? If you have gone into phase two or phase three trial, your balance sheet of the company shows very good. If you say it's not working and you take it out, balance sheet falls, the share falls. So you don't take it out, just keep going. Look for an incremental. So nobody need to do anything more than five, six, phase two, phase three clinical trials. But the companies are going on doing, and it's published, Bernard Muno has published this, to show why cost is going. Everybody tells there's a high cost. You should not have spent this cost. $55 million is the estimated cost. But people are spending billion dollars just to stay the stock market, because if you have 10 molecules in the phase two and phase three, your valuation is 20, 30, 50 billion dollars. And you can see the rejection. The, there is no need so many failure at phase three, phase two, because it should have been eliminated in phase one and phase two. So therefore, if I can make my invention better, so what has happened? The disruptive innovations came from the people, the insulin, I think penicillin, albumin. They were disruptive, and we need to do, and none of them became billionaire anyway. So we need an abundance of values that pharma has added. You can see how much of fines they have paid, ethics have fallen, so the pharma cannot be, you cannot leave all your discoveries to the pharma at the end, it needs to be taken into public system. So therefore, the problem with this ethos was old ethos. But even after human genome sequencing, it hasn't changed much. And it is very unfortunate that we are subjected to this situation.
Look at the aircraft industry. In 1902, Wright Brothers discovery, to 1940 or 50, jumbo jet, you have to trial and error, trial and error. But today, when you fly 380 or 777, they're all drawn in computer, designed in computer, flown in computer, and then manufactured. Mm -hmm. Whereas drug discovery has remained in the Wright Brothers era and hasn't moved out from the penicillin, from serendipity, including the discovery of Viagra. So what is wrong? The conventional method is closed door. Young people are not partner to the knowledge. They are only worker. Whereas I solution is young people of 20s and 30s, they made the revolution. So how do we shift? So real innovation lies in innovating how we innovate. And can we do the same thing with global resource, but in an open source? And that's all my CISBORG is, System Biology of Tuberculosis 2.0 is an OSDD portal. The advantage of open innovation, it embodies the notion that in new economic marketplace and imagine the idea that fundamentally change the conventional process and even intellectual property and research products. It allows boundaryless resource. Everyone who are willing can join to solve the problem. And you can use the social media and crowdsourcing to pick them up. Tuberculosis genome was done in 1998 by Pasteur Institute and France gave it to the public. But we haven't got the drug, even after, and we haven't got any new molecule. The still 1,000 people die in India every day this evening, and about 4,000 people worldwide. But nobody worries about it. The drugs are 50 years old. No new drug has come. The drug-resistant tuberculosis spread to 41 countries in 2007. Now it is 57 countries. It is going in 2009, and it's going to touch everybody. You cannot have somebody in Spain having the disease, and you are safe in Norway. It's not possible for infectious disease. So how to open source drug discovery paradigm is how to approach complex problems in a different way. And to take a global effort with the, op with the learning from the software and the open source and commons of the la and the genome sequencing. You mentioned about cost of management. I ran the genome project of India, the Indian Genome Variation Project, where 158 authors were partner. And I could tell you 60% of my time went in managing people. So when I dreamt of this project with 2,000 people to start with, I thought of it, I knew that it has to be something different. It cannot be the same conventional method of management. And today we have over around 6,000 people on the portal from 100 odd countries on this project. So why, how, and what? So the first, of course, drug and affordable cost we need to have. That is one. Number two is the open source, the World Wide Web Human Genome Project, and the confidentiality and IPR actually reduces the opportunity for new discovery. So if you have to understand, like the way aircraft has been built, you have to understand what is called system level. So you have to have a system design, system structure, system control and system design. So you have to understand how does the organism come, interact, physiology, and that all has to be built in computer. If we use computer science, you can see how few people are involved. Whereas if I use Facebook, you can bring a lot more people. So therefore, I have to change the strategy. There are lots of open source software available. There is open source community is fabulously excited. Actually, they welcome me first, and they gave me the confidence if possible. So one man, or somebody is good at generating ideas, somebody is good in doing things, and that's how you do. And various people of this discipline, it is impossible to bring people of this diversity together in a working space. You cannot build an institution. So you build a portal. So the portal has to be most innovative, which will connect the computer and mind together in a science 2.0 space. 
You will go through the entire drug discovery process, but on a portal called SISBOC2, and you can see already so many people, including Cambodia, Cambodia of Australia, is our IP partner, and IP, Spicy IP is our second partner, in to make sure that nobody's stealing and all our things, and also to write down the agreement that you sign in when you come to the SISBOC, that common agreement of property of commons. So you actually connect people without moving the laboratories, and everybody can stay in their own space, and you balance it. So you get two space. One is a creative space, innovative space, which are done by young people, and then there are contract research organizations who comes to process space. In the last 10 years, India has built a huge number of contract research organizations, thanks to Pfizer and Bristol Mayor Squibb and Procter and Gamble. So therefore, there are professional process, low cost process back office exist. People put up their projects, projects are stamped, people are stamped, their photograph goes up, so everybody gets credit. It is community reviewed, and funding is done by community, right? The ideas are generated, all literature information, their process, and eventually this is the idea that you will eventually get into clinical clinical trial. I'll show you the portal needed certain properties which never existed. You need a wiki which should be structured and which should be searchable. It should represent based on ontologies, need for semantic relationship and interoperability. So we build this software and this is the semantic web architecture of the OSDD and today Infosys, the India's mightiest company, actually maintains it and I can tell you, any, they would have charged $5 billion to anybody but they did it free for us. So what is interesting, although we earmarked a very large sum of money, but very little money is actually being required because most of the people have got emotionally engaged. What we, today we have, the red is the United States and 130 countries. I notice Belgium, Netherlands, everybody is around. I think all participating people here are also represented on this portal. Now, how do you give credit? So you give micro credit to everybody. It's a clip like license agreement, mandatory. Even patents can be put in, and people have put in. Quality assurance in downstream process. So it's not that it, you are completely avert from the intellectual property. We did <coughs> dreamt that we should be able to build a system biology model using crowdsourcing. We announced, but before we announced this, we got about 800 students across India. Before we announced this, we did a small pilot project and few hundred genes, not the whole genome. And I didn't know any one of those. Those who actually helped me to do, I called one day to all of them for a small workshop and to see actual kids. And you can see they're all young people out in college or just out of college, no expert. They have no a priori knowledge of expertise. A complete youth un untrusted paradigm. Students do not know how to annotate. You will never be able to do communication management will be very high. So that's where the reactions. But we believe that training is important. People should speak the same language. Web to platform, volunteers communicate, self-organizing, community approved hierarchy. You don't decide the hierarchy. The performance goes up. It happened, faculties are working under students. As long as we remove the designation, then everybody becomes performer based. Emerging functional self-organization takes place. They form their groups, how to solve the big problem. They annotate in the virtual cloud. Then even enough, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. That principle is followed here. Everybody thought there'll be curation required, but it was not. They themselves started correcting. Because we said, those who will correct maximum with the highest accuracy, we will bring them to meet some eminent scientist on a workshop on inside. So there was a huge excitement. So 120 young people got benefited, finally shortlisted. We built in the tweeters and the Facebook. So they were connecting themselves. They were <coughs> there was a community operated web to channel, started operating. And you can imagine, eventually, they actually curated 26,000 
professional journal published literature with all theses, all the informations into this portal. Okay, just to get a volume of the idea, and they managed to create the network. Just to show you, this is only 5% of the interaction that takes place in the microbacterial genome. So it's very complex, okay? So I just, so this is, they had a celebration, and this is how they worked. Everyone had the same T-shirt when they arrived. We got a philanthropist who paid for it, and leadership remarked. Everything happens in by itself. And none of them were experts. And today, they are a community. And leaderships of this community actually get transmitted all around. So Bernard Bruno, who was an expert in pharma, has said that this is amazing that how many man years of work got done in few man months. I'll finish my talk just to say one little story. We invited all the people. There was one German, somebody from Budapest, all this came. But the one German wrote us that I'm in a wheelchair. I have never come out of the house, so I cannot participate in your on-site. But I have a request. Can all these participants block the event of the next three days? And these 120 kids actually block every three minutes. And the whole event is there in C2D10 blog for the German friend. The team is led by young people who have experts to curate, and the CDS are outside. The first, second, third community papers have appeared with multiple authors. One of the faculty, he comes out every day at TV news. And you can see 83 people have contributed that day's news. So everybody sends the news, he collects and gives. So there's open science teaching forum. I also participate. Today, the project has just finishing, has moved to the clinical trial phase. Even the people from Cambridge, the Fellow of the Royal Society, Dr. Tom Blundell, an eminent structural biologist has joined. The whole paradigm has been shifted and we believe that finally the license drug will become non-exclusive and public funding goes for this. And an 80-20 principle, the whole world has recognized, the Forbes magazine has reported the arrival of my head of the, my unit, the World Wealth Organization, TB Alliance has now joined hand for molecule DNDI, and all this has happened in less than four years, and <coughs> open source chemistry, the Sante Guardian has covered this and saying this is an impossible drug chapter is the excitement. Science Magazine has wrote about the crowdsourcing and what is the future of genomics. To me, I think common is the property. An adverse drug reaction is the opportunity. If we can create an opportunity and resource sharing, and we can actually give very, very low cost cancer drug to patients. It's all finding the right patient for the right drug. Hundreds of drugs are there. So what did we learn? How groups fall in place. A good PI was a pot of honey. People who knows flock, common flocks all the way, they find each other. You don't have to do any campaign, but the PI has a job to do. You need to guide. If the task is challenging, they know when they cannot do it alone. And when they cannot do it alone, they collaborate. A structure evolves even in the audience. Incentive versus motivation, which is short term versus long term. So if you can convert any project from a professional enterprise to emotional enterprise, then it's a long term process. Together we can and we should, that's what I think. And I'm glad that all of you are of the same idea. And when it comes to health, we need to have a balanced view between health as a right and health as a business. Sometimes falling behind is not an option. You need to innovate. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Jamashari. Um, let's take a, just a few questions here, uh, and then we will move to Emile Frison's talk and have time for questions for him afterwards, and then hopefully a few minutes of general discussion. Questions? Yes. Ask you a quick ask you a question which was not uh, not focused on uh, the transformation of the drug discovery process, but to ask whether you have had some thoughts about fixing the other part of the process, which is uh, clinical trials. Yes. Uh, there is there there. The, I I I have uh, talked to a number of people about within the context of the American system to think about changing the way uh, phase three uh, clinical trials are undertaken and to treat it as a public health issue, which yeah, should, okay, maybe you, you I, I'm interested in your views on this, so I will yeah, stop I talking. Adverse drug reaction, so that if you open up a portal and you say that I have a problem with this drug, I collect volunteers in the crowdsourcing, and from that, I can actually do the mapping and figure it out which drug is actually causing problem for which genotype. For India, what we have done, 55 populations of India, we have mapped all uh, drug response genes, risk genes. I might personally, I have a genome card, which I can show you, that which allows me to have all my Genome is scanned on this. This is my personal card. Please give me back, I'll pass it on. <laughs> right? This has 147 drug response. So it is clinical trial of those data first. Second is, why can't I volunteer? And I'll take only educated bachelor's graduates to do this, who said, I want to be a volunteer, and my data can go public. So e-clinical trial is the future, according to me. Okay, this is 40 is wrong because, you know, today, if you bring a drug which is 100 times cheaper but equally efficient, you cannot take it to FDA. Because FDA wants more efficient, it doesn't matter what the cost is. But I cannot take a drug which is 100 times cheaper but equally potent of the existing drug because that's a monopoly is maintained by the other company. So in India, since we don't have that problem, so government, you can see that we have influenced the government already. And we said we are going to do a new generation to phase two because it's very expensive. Phase one has to be done under present regulatory condition, toxicity. But phase three is meaningless to keep it the way we are doing. Phase three can open up. And we are going to do tuberculosis drug, this particular molecule which is coming in now for clinical trial next month. We have got the regulatory, we are moving into there phase one clinical trial, that phase two, sorry, phase two B we are getting, because phase two A is already done in, uh, in, uh, in Africa, this molecule, uh, from the TB Alliance. So therefore, we believe that this will be the new way to start. You are absolutely right. We need to change the whole process. Yes, one more. crowd choose research project to do and to fund. Um, if, can you talk about how that process works? And then the funding is opened up. There is a, everybody puts their comment. Based on the review comment, a lot of, there is another defined review at the express also and then fund it. So my argument is any crazy idea must be funded, okay? But fund lower level, okay? Then if the funding goes beyond $200,000, then the project moves into the next tier of the set of people. But all are open. Even I cannot take money, so there's this common money. Even I cannot take a money for my pharmacogenomics project unless it is in the portal. And unless it is kept for 15 days, people to comment. And everybody is going. What is interesting in Indian culture, I'm sure Scaria will agree with me, we 
we, we have a respect for seniors. On the face, we never say anything. But what is interesting, I discovered this, that on the Facebook, anybody can say anything. You don't disclose your privacy in person, but you don't mind putting it in an item. So this is a very interesting thing. Students are so ultra critical, unlike in the classroom, <laughs> right? This something not seeing you has a great advantage. And that's what is happening. And number two, the rural India, small town, colleges, who are not the elite institution, in my list, at any given time out of 6,000, 20% is active. But I don't have elite students. Most of the students are drawn from small colleges and small institutions, who has very little opportunity. And they are so excited because they have an access to the supercomputer. And they have never had an access to the supercomputer. And we fund, so we fund everybody. We fund even uh, the, the computer connectivity charges of those students through the supercomputer access. So even, even the photon, you know, the stick, we distribute. But what is interesting, we tell everybody, wherever we're taking money, this is like a kibbutz. The money is kept in the pool. You, what you need, you take. When you take the money, you will take. Nobody will question you why you are using this. But remember, today, 1,000 Indians will die today night. And their ghost is looking at you. So don't use the money for other purpose. Just to use as much as you need. Just to tell you, I earmarked budget about $120 million. We put $37 million. We haven't spent more than $5 million, maybe $6, 7000000 million. And people don't take money. Even clinical trials and new doctors, everybody says, no, no, for this project, no money. So therefore, uh, people don't take travel money to attend meetings. It's, so what we have done, we have been able to convert a professional engagement into an emotional engagement. And therefore, if you have to do something common good that touches everybody, that only will work with common. But when it will create few people, you know, like that yesterday's drama, we are perfectly common, but we have partitioned our uh, space into small, small pieces, and that will not work. That's why global warming will work. You know, if I can convince the people of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Netherlands, Berkeley, that uh, you, you will go underwater if India and China uses fossil fuel. So better solve a solar energy problem and give the technology free to India. Otherwise, you are going to go underwater. Anyway, Bombay will go, Chennai, but that's 100 million will go, doesn't matter. Still billion will be left. <laughs> but there'll be no Berkeley. So I go and tell Berkeley, that let's collaborate, and we need to create low energy cost solution to the solar energy problem. So see, this is common connection has to be done. That's why carbon dioxide capturing and all methane can be a common interest. So unless you find a common touching point, if I say tomorrow I will come up with a diabetes as a common open source network, because your diabetes doesn't hurt me. But your infection causes me problems, a future potential. So you have to connect and show it is a global problem. So commons will work only when there's a global problem. Thank you very much. Yes. I need a tea, but unfortunately I won't be in the lunch. I need to leave around 1 o'clock. So other time available after, so I can discuss this then. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is also a renowned educator, researcher, and prolific author. Is the general director of Bioversity International um, in Rome. And I like this. Bioversity International uses agricultural biodiversity to improve people's lives. So. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to you.
Good morning, everybody. It's a, a real challenge to follow uh, Samir's presentation <coughs> and such a, an exciting uh, talk that he has given, an, an inspirational one. Uh, we are jumping here from medical science or medical research to agriculture. And of course, you can say, well, there's not much in common, except for the fact that we will both be talking about saving people's lives. And um, what I will be talking about is the, the role of the global commons in supporting livelihoods and food security in developing countries. But before I start, uh, unlike what uh, Tom said, I, I'm sure that most of you have never heard of Biodiversity International before coming to this conference. So I'll just spend uh, a couple of minutes saying what we are about. We are a non-profit uh, international research organization that is present uh, in about 20 different countries and with activities in about 100 different countries. We are doing international research uh, dedicated to the conservation and the use of agricultural biodiversity. And uh, we undertake that scientific research uh, on sustainable use of that diversity in order to benefit people in the developing world. But actually, a lot of that also has broader applicability worldwide. Um, this is just our geographical spread. We are present in, in all continents. And our vision is a world in which smallholder farming communities in developing countries are thriving and sustainable. And uh, our purpose is to investigate and promote the use of agricultural biodiversity in order to achieve better nutrition, improve smallholders' livelihoods, and enhance agricultural sustainability. Now, <coughs> we um, have uh, developed strategic priorities for the next 10 years. The first one is really uh, about the use of the existing diversity. Currently, agricultural intensification on the last uh, 50 years has meant a simplification of the production system with uh, a lot of the research and, and actually uh, cultivation happening with just a few crops, uh, essentially producing um, more calories. And I think that is uh, bringing a lot of problems in terms of the sustainability of the pro production system, but also the nutrition with the simplification of diets and uh, ongoing non-communicable diseases as a result. And uh, we, we really have to look at a different paradigm. But we also need to conserve the diversity that is necessary to achieve that. And there we are working at conserving the diversity in the farming system so that it continues to evolve in a dynamic way and looking at the accessibility of that diversity. If we don't have access to it, there's no point in, in uh, maintaining it. <coughs> now, why is that diversity important? We know that the key challenges that are facing the world and essentially the developing world more particularly, we still have one billion people that are poor and hungry about two billion people additional that suffer from malnutrition by lack of micronutrients and imbalanced diets. And there is a tremendous uh, pressure of environmental degradation associated with our current model of agriculture, but also of um, the general development of, of society. And we know that there are a number of exacerbating factors, climate change, and we see today already the consequences of that climate change in terms of more frequent and more intense uh, extreme event weather events, population growth uh, with an expected at least 9 billion people uh, 40 years from now, water scarcity that is uh, becoming uh, really uh, a serious problem, and the price fluctuation and the market dynamics that have been throwing a few more hundred, a uh, few hundreds millions of people more into hunger and poverty in the last uh, two, three years. So what is the potential of agricultural biodiversity to address that? Well, very clearly, a more diverse diet resulting for a more diverse agriculture will uh, have nutritional health gains. It can improve uh, uh, rural livelihoods. A smallholder farmer that has only half a hectare of land cannot live on just growing half a hectare of rice. You have to diversify that production and with more high value crops such as vegetables and fruits. A system uh, that is sustainable and resilient requires diversity. 
and uh, there is ample evidence of the links between diversity and resilience and sustainability. And finally, not just look at the production of food or other agricultural products, but at the role of ecosystem services such as water recycling, uh, pollination, nutrient recycling, etc., in a healthy agricultural system. Most of these things have been considered as externalities to agriculture, and actually with costs transferred from the agricultural sector to the environment, or from the agricultural sector to the health sector. And I think we must take those things into consideration. So in order to achieve those benefits, access to diversity is, is really key. And that's what uh, leads me to uh, more specifically now see what has been happening in the last uh, several decades in terms of access to diversity. Prior to uh, the um, early 80s, the diversity of uh, genetic resources was really freely available and, and freely exchanged. Uh, this relies on, on a tradition of exchange of material between farmers for millennia, and that was continued also in the last century among scientists. But since the mid-80s, uh, the world has engaged in, in protracted discussions about the control, management, the use and share of uh, benefits derived from genetic resources. And this has been uh, a period marked by high levels of political and legal uncertainty at organizational, national, and international level about these issues of access uh, to diversity and, and sharing of benefits. And this has had impacts on how countries, companies, university treat genetic resources, and that has really had a very profound um, impact. And there's been a, a widespread phenomenon of, of research and conservation efforts being frustrated due to the inability of getting access to plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. Now, the major uh, steps in the last few decades was the international community coming together uh, in a, a commission on plant genetic resources for food and agriculture that was convened by FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And they um, came to an agreement about an international undertaking on plant genetic resources in 1983, which was a non-legally binding agreement, but uh, the expression of a common understanding and it still recognized plant genetic resources for food and agriculture as a common heritage of humankind. But there were also different interpretations of different countries of what that meant and how that could be translated into practice. And there has been really a paradigm shift in uh, from starting from the uh, mid 80s probably, from the notion of genetic resources being in the public domain, common heritage of humankind, to one of hyper-ownership. And with the increased use of intellectual property rights on uh, genetic resources that were be being developed in varieties that were commercialized, and in reaction to that, many developing countries that asserted sovereign rights over genetic resources, but they asserted them by basically closing their, bar their uh, boundaries and not exchanging material anymore. And we have seen drastic decreases in availability of that diversity uh, starting in the um, early 90s. Now, I think there was a broad recognition that there was a need to move forward and try to harmonize what was happening in plant genetic resources for food and agriculture with the broader debate uh, that was taking place in the com and led to the Convention on Biological <coughs> Diversity adopted in 1992 in, in Rio. And we recently had the 20th anniversary of that with Rio plus 20 uh, in June. Uh, in parallel to that, the World Trade Organization adopted the PRIPS agreement, which uh, tended to generalize the use of intellectual property rights uh, also in, uh, at international level. And there was a conflict between the, the notion of national sovereignty over genetic resources that was embedded in the Convention on Biological Diversity, a legally binding agreement, and the international undertaking that was adopted about 10 years earlier, which had this notion of uh, common uh, heritage of humankind. And therefore, it was um, 
the, the countries were asked to renegotiate a binding agreement to replace the international undertaking, one that would be specific to plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. Now, this negotiation has taken place between 1994 and 2001. It's been a long and difficult negotiation. There has been essentially a north-south divide, the north having the technology and the intellectual property over a lot of the uh, inventions, and the south uh, considering it had a lot of the diversity that was necessary to make progress in uh, plant improvement. And the uh, gradual recognition that there was a need for a multilateral system, that just bilateral deals of access and sharing of benefits was not going to work for agriculture. So why are things so complicated? Um, first of all, that shift from common heritage to of humankind to national sovereignty and the private con uh, forms of control over diversity was linked to a confluence of, of different factors. The rise of biotechnology that uh, created possibilities for private sector investment in plant breeding and protecting their interest by uh, patents. The uh, concomitant pressure of uh, broader use of intellectual property rights with the TRIPS agreement. The relative lack of capacity of most developing countries to actually take advantage of these technologies and IPRs and a dramatically increased level of private sector investment in agriculture and the concomitant drastic decrease in public investment. So there have been also in, in parallel to that both real and alleged accounts of, of unfair taking or biopiracy which has uh, led to further uh, exacerbating tensions in the system with counter assertions of, of sovereign rights of control over these genetic resources, basically closing the, the boundaries and not providing access, and, and a lot of high-level political controversy uh, during these uh, negotiations, and, and also legal uncertainty. So some of the key questions, who is the owner of the material that is held in gene banks? Uh, in the past, a lot of that material has been collected, and uh, the access to that material was provided freely, now, who is owning what was collected 10, 15, 20 years earlier? Uh, is it the country where the material originally came from? Is it the country where the collection is being held? Uh, is it the farmers that selected the varieties maybe 50, 100 years ago? Is it humanities? Um, and then also, if new varieties are the result of applying technology to some genetic material, why the rights of the material provided are not recognized in the final product. So why the, the raw material that was utilized is considered to be taken for granted and, and for free. So why does plant genetic resources for food and agriculture deserve a, a special regime of access and benefit sharing? In the case of diversity used for, uh, let's say, pharmaceutical purposes, you can trace the link between a plant that was uh, in which uh, an active compound was uh, detected and the uh, firm, the company that will uh, commercialize a product derived from that, there is a direct link there and you can have a bilateral agreement of access and benefit sharing. In the case of plant genetic resources for agriculture and food and agriculture, it's very different. <coughs> you can't have those direct link of reasons. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of, uh, in agricultural uh, genetic resources, the it's the intraspecific diversity that matters to different varieties of a crop. Uh, while uh, there is much less interest in that in, in the case of uh, wild uh, material for industrial purposes, uh, the um, products of human selection uh, are depending on farmers and their continued uh, survival, while in the case of uh, products from taken from, from a wild environment uh, are just a result of natural selection. And there are uh, other um, differences. One of the, the most important ones is, is really the complexity of, of breeding. And I'm just showing here a small part of a pedigree of a modern variety uh, of wheat, whereby uh, this is the result of crosses that have taken place 
probably over um, 10, 20 years, with material uh, coming from uh, maybe 50, 60, 70 different original varieties that were cultivated by, by farmers traditionally and originating maybe from 20 different countries. So what's the country of origin of the final product? Who owns that material? It's very difficult to have a bilateral link. And because of that complexity, and also the fact that um, countries are very highly interdependent on diversity for their food security on material that originates on another continent. And uh, you can see here that Australia, their food security depends 100% on crops that originated outside of Australia. And most areas of the world actually have very high percentages of interdependence. So because of that complexity of the breeding process and because of this notion of interdependence and that diversity uh, doesn't stop at borders, uh, you can have the same variety uh, occurring across the different sides of the border, it's very difficult to do things in a bilateral way. And that's why it was necessary essentially to recreate a common for plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. And that is what was attempted uh, with the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture that resulted from these seven years of ne negotiation and was adopted by the FAO um, uh, conference in 2001. So this was the adoption of a binding instrument on the basis of the, a renegotiated international undertaking, but that was compatible with the Convention on Biological Diversity, recognizing the sovereign rights, but creating new tools for recreating that commons. So the, uh, the treaty, in, in a nutshell, it entered into force in 2004, after 50 countries had ratified it. Today it's been uh, signed by 127 countries and the European Union. Plant genetic resources for food and agriculture um, are the scope uh, of the uh, agreement, of the treaty, but it's those resources that are under the control of the contracting party and in the public domain, so it does not affect uh, genetic resources held by a private company, for example, unless they make it voluntarily a part of the multilateral system. And the objectives are the conservation and sustainable use of plant genetic resources and the equitable uh, sharing of benefits arising out of their use in harmony with the convention. Uh, I'm not going to go through the, the actual structure of the uh, treaty itself, but uh, pay particular attention to the multilateral system because that's really what recreated the, the, the comments uh, about uh, plant genetic resource for food and agriculture. The access, um, each country that has ratified is basically uh, in or should be putting into the common pool the genetic resources that is under the control of that um, um, country uh, and that uh, should be made available um, and the, the access should be facilitated for uh, purposes of research, breeding and training. And the access to all material in the multilateral system is uh, facilitated to all the parties that have ratified the treaty. Now, regarding the benefit sharing, uh, the negotiations included um, an agreed percentage of benefits derived from the co commercialization of the final product uh, to a common fund that is managed by the governing body of the treaty. And so also the benefit sharing is multilateral. The access is multilateral in the sense that everybody puts in what they have and they ac have access to the whole pool um, of all the countries that have put everything in common, but also the benefit sharing is not going back to an individual country, uh, but to a common pot, and it's the countries collectively that decide on how to use uh, those resources. So uh, how to operationalize the treaty was the adoption of, of an instrument, the Standard Material Transfer Agreement. Uh, some of the characteristics of that is that the material that was originally provided cannot be protected by intellectual property rights in the form that it was received, uh, which is also compatible with the, the notion of, of an IPR uh, right. It, there should be a, a discovery, so, but it's made clear that 
um, material receipt cannot be protected. And uh, the agreements uh, about the sharing of the benefits are uh, specified in that. And the text of the standard material uh, transfer agreement is common to all exchanges. It's a template that cannot be modified. So this is simplifying the agreements between the providers and the users of diversity in that uh, it doesn't have to be renegotiated every time. Now, uh, when to use that? When there is a real transfer of material, of course, and uh, when the material is a plant genetic resource for food and agriculture, that means that if grain is exchanged as a commodity uh, for consumption, that's not, you shouldn't be using the standard material transfer agreement. And the purpose has to be for research, breeding, and training. If you want to use it for another purpose, you cannot use the standard material transfer agreement. And also, the gen plant genetic resources for food and agriculture should be used for food and feed purposes. Uh, you could use sorghum or maize for biofuel purposes, for example. Again, the standard material transfer agreement cannot be used for that. Um, some characteristics of the multilateral system. It, um, the access and benefit sharing doesn't require a, a prior informed consent of individual uh, providers. It's really creating that, that comment where the, the rules of the game are established once and for all. The material should be made available for free or at only minimal administrative costs. Uh, the standard material transfer agreement contains all the conditions for access, use, and benefit sharing, and the material is transferred, uh, should be transferred expeditiously, and there should be, uh, according to the treaty, no need to track individual transfers. I'll come back to that. This is one of the uh, difficulties which we haven't been able to resolve yet because the standard material transfer agreement actually foresees the, the uh, listing of individual uh, accessions. And then the percentage of, of benefits uh, driving from commercialization was included. Um, now, in, in uh, comparison with that, what is happening for uh, genetic resources that are not plant genetic resources covered by the treaty, you have to have prior informed consent. Uh, you have to have a bilateral negotiation, which is often a costly procedure. Uh, there are often also upfront payments required to have access. Uh, this bilateral agreement uh, has to be according to mutually agreed terms, so it has to be negotiated on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, also, uh, the, the there's no standard uh, percentage of, of benefits flowing back uh, about the material. Now. This focus on, on, on access and benefit sharing um, in parallel with the adoption of the standard material transfer agreement by the uh, treaty, there was also a process under the convention of negotiating a general protocol on access and benefit sharing for all genetic resources, not just for food and agriculture, but uh, for all. And actually, um, there has been a tendency by some negotiators to undo what had been achieved in the negotiations of the international treaty uh, by reasserting uh, more control over the, the diversity. Um, but finally, the, the text that was adopted in Nagoya in 2010 uh, recognizes the international treaty and, and the specific provisions for food and agriculture. So that was safeguarded. And um, this, the Nagoya Protocol is the framework for determining rules of genetic resources for food and agriculture that are not under the treaty. <coughs> now, the current state of, of ABS, I think there's been a significant de jure progress, but there are still many issues to be addressed. I think the intention was very clear, the objectives are very clear, uh, and I think the justification for it is, is very strong. But to put it in practice, um, is, is not that easy. There are still wavering levels of commitment uh, and low levels of follow through on the, the treaty. Uh, I said 127 countries have ratified the treaty. The number of countries that have actually implemented it actively and started exchanging material through the SMTA uh, is, is much less. A uh, few, few hands would uh, suffice to, to count them. 
So there is additional work required to get the architecture of this overall ABS system finalized to working. Um, so what are some of the obstacles to the successful implementation? There's a lack of implementation of the treaty at the national level. There are still legal, uh, lack of legal certainty about some uh, aspects of the treaty. There is also a bit of a reluctance of the private sector to use material from the treaty because of the need to trace back and the uh, fact of, of the obligatory benefit sharing. Uh, there's no uh, clarity yet, for example, for how long that benefit sharing has to apply. Uh, for when we have a patent, we know how long the patent is valid. There is some uncertainty about uh, the duration of benefit sharing. So this will require still action both at the national and at international level. And we have been, uh, Biodiversity International has been involved in working with the Secretariat of the Treaty and FAO in a joint program to facilitate the implementation of the treaty and try to resolve some of the questions that are um, there. And the main focus is on, on national implementation, looking at technical, legal, and administrative issues on how practically to implement things, uh, bringing together the, uh, the different parties from the min different ministries uh, together around the table and, and sort out these practicalities and also look at the supportive documentation and information uh, that is needed. Um, this requires the different stakeholders to come together to identify, analyze the different factors uh, in each country uh, in order to be able to participate in the multilateral system, to draft policies. In some cases, uh, legislation has to be modified to be compatible with the treaty, um, and uh, that requires a lot of work of, of actually uh, holding workshops, considering options, developing drafts, etc. Uh, often among people that are not used to speak to each other. Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Agriculture uh, often live in silos, and it's important that they come together to resolve these issues. So there's a lot of work that has been done uh, by Biodiversity and, and partners in, in terms of research and advocacy to uh, help uh, the f move forward the thinking in this area. and. Uh, foster collaboration and, and capacity building. Uh, we have been working with also uh, some sister centers in the CGIR uh, to identify options for system-wide approaches on, on implementation of the international legal obligations by the CGIR centers who have put their collections under the international treaty and also building capacity in supporting uh, partners at the national level. So. I think it's important also to support the use through information systems. If we don't know what diversity is present, it cannot be utilized, and, and that's an important part of the availability and the access is also have access to information. So we've been working on developing a central portal of uh, information about what diversity is where and what are the characteristics of that diversity so that it can be more easily uh, used. Uh, there's an effort in uh, helping with pre-breeding, that is uh, tapping into a much wider diversity of crop wild relatives, uh, that is uh, pre-competitive research uh, and uh, supporting those. And finally, uh, also there's uh, an effort now to develop a technology transfer platform um, uh, that involves both the pub public and the private sector uh, this was recently developed in a strategy of the, of the treaty. So what's at risk uh, if this doesn't work? I think that the lack of access will prevent addressing the challenges that I talked about at the beginning of my presentation about uh, food and nutrition security, uh, addressing the problems uh, f of facing uh, climate change, and um, we require that the, the access to genetic resource because it is essential for productivity increases and adaptation. And the important diversity is still not available to uh, breeders. A lot of material is in, in um, uh, the wild still or being cultivated and not present in collections. And therefore, in conclusion, uh, I think that steps have been taken. We have the legal framework, uh, which is the international treaty. There has been a funding mechanism to ensure the conservation uh, of, that div of diversity put in place. Steps have been taken towards 
developing conservation strategies for different uh, crops, uh, a, a global information system is being built, and a lot of effort has been ensuring the safety of material by having safety duplication of the collections, but there's still a lot that needs to be done. Uh, collaboration on rational conservation strategies in order to avoid duplication, resources are limited. Collaboration for the utilization of that diversity, building the capacity in conservation and breeding, and as I mentioned, the national implementation of the treaty, without which uh, the whole treaty could actually still collapse if, if we don't make progress in that. So I thank you for your attention. I'm willing to take uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amir Kuzan. I, I actually would like to ask a question. Um, uh, last year at the uh, New York University Law School uh, workshop on um, uh, constructed cultural commons, Lynn Ostrom gave a plenary, and one of the questions that a graduate student asked her was, well, this is really great talk about the commons and everything, but what are we going to do about global climate change? And um, it sounds different than, than what you're talking about, but you know what her answer was, well, don't wait for the guys on top to do something. And essentially, in other words, she's talking about the role of collective action and building institutions, local institutions. My question is for you, in your work, um, do you see a role um, for um, the, the, the commenters, the local people um, on the ground to have a voice in this, in this uh, um, kind of activities that you're working on? Are there mainly just governments to governments? Um, 